So welcome everybody to Getting to the Root of Modern Disease. My name is Gina Sager and I'm your host. And in this self-empowering summit, we will envision a new paradigm for healing based on wholeness, tapping into foundational wisdom, both ancient and modern, to create the conditions that favor deep and lasting healing of body, mind, and spirit. Step out of the box with me and our panel of healers as we open a deep and transformative conversation that gets to the very root of modern dis-ease and allows access to the healing powers that are your birthright. So today, I am so delighted and honored to welcome Cater Brown. Cater, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Gina, it's a delight to be here. So Cater today is gonna to talk to us about water and ash. The troubles of this world can only be healed from the other world. And I cannot wait to hear about that. But first, let me tell you who Cater is. Cater is an internationally known ceremonialist and cowrie shell diviner, a healer, intuitive, and teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness with over 35 years of professional experience. Over this time, Cater has developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing by braiding together his depth of clinical knowledge of experiential psychotherapies with more nature-based indigenous wisdom teachings and ritual healing methods from around the world. Cater is the founder and director of Rites of Passage Council, an organization offering nature-based treatment and professional training programs. He is a member of International Wilderness Guides Council and known for his ability to blend many creative and expressive forms of depth psychology and therapy with more ancient methods of healing through vision quest, ceremonies, sweat lodge ceremonies, rites of passage experiences, and personalized ceremonies and rituals in his work with individuals, couples, groups, and communities. Cater lives in the highlands of Western North Carolina. And Cater, I'd love to share some words from uh, one of your elders and teachers, if I may, Maladoma Somme. Um, is a world-renowned author, teacher, and initiated elder in the West African shaman tradition. And he says, I've known Cater for a long time as a man of spirit with a remarkable devotion to healing. He tends to this duty with royalty and ferocious commitment. As a man who hears the call of earth and nature, Cater extends his hand to those in quest of change and transformation and is always willing to lead them into and guide them through a deep sense of communion with themselves. Having worked with him in a number of rituals and ceremonies and watched carefully the way he gives him himself to spirit, I have come to respect his priestly devotion to the sacred in nature and in every human. His work deserves respect and reverence. So, wow. I have had a great good fortune to be the recipient of some of that wisdom. So I'll be happy to share some of that if the occasion arises. But for now, water and ash. The troubles of this world can only be healed from the other world. What do you mean by that, Cater? That is so intriguing. Well, first, uh, I'd like to begin by offering a prayer of gratitude uh, to the ancestors on whose shoulders we stand. You know, their, their tears, their laughter, their dreams, their wobbles and uh, successes. And... Um, just as an acknowledgement of that realm, since we're going to be talking about that. And also um, want to acknowledge my teachers, uh, Maladoma Somme, Will Rocking Bear, and many, many others, and their teachers, teachers before them, uh, that enable me to sit here and uh, offer a bit of what I've learned from them, um, and how I understand the teachings that I've learned from them. So much gratitude to all those. Um, Water and ash. Um, when I sat down to write the, the title and it says, all right, what's the title of this going to be? Um, I thought about some of the rituals that I've done over the years and some of the teachings. And that is um, water being of this, of this realm um, of life and ash being that which is combusted down uh, in the physical world that can't be combusted any further. And so it's, it's considered to be at the threshold between this world and that world. One of the, one of the teachings uh, I've received is that in ritual, when we offer ash with our left hand, 
because it's at the threshold between the worlds, it shows up as fire in the other realm. So the sprinkling of ash here shows up as fire in the realm to, of the ancestors. And also water and ash or fire and water um, in a lot of the uh, Genesis stories of many indigenous cultures, um, they begin by mentioning these two elemental ancestors, grandfather fire and, and grandmother water or grandmother ice. And out of these two elemental ancestors, you and I now get to sit here and have a conversation um, that we're the extension uh, of our elemental ancestors as well. And then the other thing about the title, so I borrowed half the, uh, uh, the, the second part, the troubles of this world can only, be, can only be mended or healed from the other world. And so it's half of a, a, a proverb, an old Irish proverb. So um, thanks again to my Irish ancestors. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, uh, the Irish, the old Irish proverb is that the troubles in this world, or we could say the sorrows in this world, can only be healed from the other world. And then it goes on to say that the troubles in the other world can only be healed from this world. So it implies this reciprocal relationship um, that is, in indigenous cultures, palpable. It's not simply a, a, a theoretical construct of thought. It's actually a palpable relationship of interaction um, that we have between this physical realm and, and the realm of our ancestors. And um, as I like to tell people, that uh, the uh, that being dead doesn't uh, make one an ancestor. No more than being alive makes one healthy, conscious, and well. And so there's this whole range of unwellness, we could say, that circulates between the unwell dead and the unwell living, that, and that's where our attention uh, goes to. And, and so in... In indigenous culture, when there's turmoil here, the first thing is we turn our attention there and see where turmoil has already been existing. Um, and so these parallels between the physical realm and spiritual realm, you know, having a background in, in clinical psychotherapy, um, we have what's uh, called epigenetics now. And that's another way of saying working with the ancestors. <laughs> or we have in, in psychotherapy, uh, you know, that wonderful work, uh, family constellation work. That's another way of saying working with the ancestors. Um, but indigenous reality, it is literally working with that realm. Uh, both that is that which is unwell and that which is assist us, that which is well. And I think that's an important part, Cater, because I know so many of us have ancestors that we don't really like to think about much. <laughs> you, you've been so so generous to make the distinction that we're working with the, those who have lived and died well yes. for our guidance. Yeah, that's the uh, yeah. Sometimes when I bring up this idea, and and uh, and somebody says, "Well, I didn't like them when they were here. Why would I want to be?" I mean, ask them anything now. It's good riddance, goodbye, so long. And um, and what that does is it it uh, creates a division and a separation, um, and it perpetuates turmoil. Okay. Um, it it le it creates an unresolved. So it's not like we are not connected. Um, and so to call on what we could say are calling on our ancestral helping spirits is to, to go way back beyond the trouble, beyond the turmoil, um, to look back to um, back during the times where these ceremonies and rituals, uh, say grief rituals that were typically done um, uh, when there's a death there would be grief rituals. And then there could be things that we might call ancestralization rituals, things that were done to ensure the passage of, of, our, of that uh, living being or loved one 
to the realm of the ancestors. And so because these things have been uh, lost or denied in some cases, um, those ways of attending uh, the passage uh, through death with appropriate grief rituals and ancestralization rituals, they don't happen. And I say, so when those things don't happen, uh, or another, let me say another way to think about it is when, when one dies that we say we love and they have to cross this river in order to get to the realm of the ancestors, it's tears that provide the, the river. And if we don't create the river with our grief, they don't get across. And if they don't get across, then some of us start getting pulled into that river. Accidents, suicides, tragedies, illnesses, um, because of that unacknowledged grief. Um, and so often I find uh, unacknowledged grief as being the source of a lot of illness and turmoil in the physical realm. Um, and it is this uh, ritually providing this grief that enables that that clean passage. Um, and th th there's a lot more I could say about that, but I want to pause a minute and see, see what's bubbling. Well, what's bubbling for me is honestly the Western medical tradition um, that in my experience sort of sees death as a failure, you know? And so it's, it's so there's the piece of like, thank, thank goodness they're gone. And then there's the, uh, the other piece of, you know, we don't really realize that death is a part of life. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think it seems really important to bring these rituals into our lives and to help us have a different relationship with our ancestors and understand like even more deeply that, that, that relationship or lack of relationship, whether we want to talk about it or not is really impacting us mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And that disconnectedness is of course my premise that leads to the dis ease. Mm -hmm. However, it shows up. Yeah. The, the, in our, in our, um, Western society of modernity, we'll frame it in that context. Grief gets regulated to the, uh, to being that of a personal dilemma. Uh, and, and the shift of the paradigm is grief is not a personal dilemma. It is a collective responsibility to feed the spirits. And, and it is this, uh, you know, another uh, Guatemalan shaman, Martin Prechtel, I like the way he uses this, these words, grief and praise, and he lines them up together, saying, because they're really the same thing. Um, and yet we are, um, we are regulated to time clocks and work schedules and, and brief moments to acknowledge the passing uh, of a loved one. And our grief doesn't uh, conveniently fit into uh, the demands of our culture, the demands of our society. Um, and so to become unhinged and, and messy with grief is, uh, is a necessary component to maintaining health and healing. Um, I just believe that so much unacknowledged grief is at the source of so much uh, physical turmoil and pain. Yes. Um, and even other secondary emotions. There's a, a saying I learned from Africa that said, uh, um, an angry man is a man on the road to grief. And the sooner he gets there, the better for him and for us. Wow. And, and so we have to even treat other emotions as like, you know, don't, don't shy away from the, the upset, angry person. Let's move in close. Let's hear about this because we know where he's headed or we know where she's headed. And we have to walk with them till they get all the way to the to the you know to the place of grief because this anger is just a it's just a front, yes. um, and yet petrified grief becomes anger, and then we you know all kind of turmoil and things happen, and and that we do to each other and do to ourselves at that point. Wow, and so I think I think you're already sort of answering this next question, but. Um, we, I guess we all sort of know how we handle grief 
in the Western modern world. But help us, help me be clearer about how an indigenous paradigm of both handling grief and just working with illness or dis-ease has the potential to help us, to help us deal more skillfully with life as it is. So, you know, my, I'm, I'm thinking now about in, in my uh, personal ancestral lineage or indigenous lineage that, that goes into the British Isles and into Ireland, um, when one would die, they would, uh, you know, essentially lay them out on the table, the kitchen table for three days. This three day period is a common, uh, I see that in other cultures, other traditions, other indigenous traditions, I'll have a three day period of, of being with the body and grieving. Um, in, the, in, the, in the old Irish tradition, uh, they would bring in what would they would call the keeners or keening women or keening, and keening means to cry. It's a, I think it's a, a Scots Gaelic word or an old uh, Irish word that means to cry. And so they would bring in uh, the keeners, I call them tear listeners. And the tear listeners would come into a situation and listen for the grief and then begin to give voice to it and begin to wail. And that would activate the grief in, in the room. And then it would begin to, to unleash because that was the necessary to, to convey, to, to release this one. Um, and what happened in those contexts, the, uh, the church came in and, and so, you know, said, basically things are, this is kind of out of control. <laughs> we, need to, we need to dampen this. We have much more appropriate ways of dealing with this. Um, and the body is whisked out of the home and, you know, taken somewhere else and, and we'll show up later you know, to offer our respects. Um, and when I was in uh, the one time I went to Africa with Maladoma, we got to go to a grief ritual. So in a similar way, it was three days of um, uh, where everybody from different villages comes to this one to the one place, one village where the person died, and they have a grief shrine where the body sits, um, and. Uh, they have people stationed at the shrine um, and people can essentially, it, it, it goes on for, for, you know, literally days and people can come to the shrine and wail and scream and cry and be held at the edges of, of, uh, of the shrine so they don't go in there, but are able to really, in, in a, if I use a psychological world, much more of a psycho uh, dramatic expression of emotion, um, be able to release and acknowledge whatever they felt. Um, and then, the, and so it's just a, a, a healthier way, you know, it's three days is hard to, um, to, uh, you know, to enter that thought and process in the Western culture that we're going to step into this, into this, this way of being for three days. Um, but even three days is short, you know. Um, so it's uh, it, it's a way of uh, attending um, to not letting grief become lodged or or stuck in our bodies, um, or become what's called what the Buddhists would call a hungry ghost that moves through family systems, um, and. Uh, uh, reminds me of another story that uh, I was sharing the other day about um, I was working in a wilderness rehab center with teenagers and um, so it meant if a teenager was sitting in front of me they had they had gone down the road of drugs and alcohol as a way to medicate their own turmoil um, and in this case I was sitting with the, the, the mother and father of this teen and uh, they were telling me that, you know, our, our son's 17. We don't know what's going on. He was a great kid, involved in sports, doing great scholastically in school, um, had friends and just, you know, really doing well. And after his birthday, got horribly depressed. 
and then not long after began, you know, using drugs and alcohol, and we, just, we, we don't know what happened. We don't think there's been any trauma. We can't figure out anything that's going on. Um, so part of, my, uh, part of my training is then not just to look psychologically at the picture, but to consider other influences that are, uh, could be more ancestral. So in doing that, I opened up my um, perceptual field of uh, what, what I would say, um, extended my perceptual field of reality to include the other world. Mm. And I had the sense of uh, an old man standing beside mom and an old man standing beside dad. And I got really curious, who, who are these two people? And so I inquired with mom about her family and she eventually made her way around to telling me about her grandfather that had committed suicide mm -hmm. when her father was around 18, 19 years old. And I said, okay, now I know who this is. And so I began a, a similar line of inquiry with dad and he eventually made his way around to his dad and his grandfather. And, and eventually told me that his dad had committed suicide as well when he was a, a teenager. Oh, yeah. um, and so I, I realized that this, this unacknowledged grief, and I could see it in their faces, um, had taken up residence in, the, in their son when he reached 17. Um, and so the, the response is to bring the awareness to this uh, hungry ghost, as it were, that's now moving through this family system and has landed on their son and, and um, to, to uh, bring to their attention the need, the necessity of, of acknowledging their grief um, in this loss so that this can free their son up. Um, I've discovered in my work that that which gets repressed emotionally gets projected energetically out into their immediate environment. And so whoever seems to be the most vulnerable host, which are typically the children, mm -hmm. um, pick it up and manifest it in some form. Uh, and so I think as a, as a society, we can look at adolescence as the collective expression of that of which is unacknowledged uh, and repressed. Uh, much more um, globally. Um, and so that's in, in our, it's uh, this desire for adolescence to, uh, if I borrow a Michael Mead term, brush up against the sacred. Um, what I mean is as to, they, they brush up against <clears throat> that which is dangerous and risky uh, because that's where the sacred lives. Now, they don't know that, um, but that's the encounter. That's the excitement. That's the rush. They, there's an aliveness. There's a, a mystery at that edge. Um, so I've always said, if we don't provide the initiatory rites of passages uh, for our people, and, and I don't say adolescence because we have adolescence that can be 70 years old, <laughs> still <laughs> operating from that paradigm. But if we don't provide those initiatory experiences um, and, and transitional encounters, and then they will be created. You know, adolescents will create them um, for themselves. And they're, they're, the ones they create aren't guided by any initiatory elder um, or you really serve a purpose uh, that we would hope it serves. The, the self-created initiations and rites of passage often serve to bind one's uh, identity and consciousness to a group consciousness um, that is self-serving. And in traditional indigenous forms of rites of passage, the initiatory experience was to bring one's consciousness and identity to the gift of medicine or healing that they came into this world to offer. And, and, and to get about offering that. Um, 
and you can see the, the, the extreme shadow form of that present in gang activity, where you have all these very ritualized activities and, and, and uh, roles. Um, but the, the outcome again is to bind one to a group consciousness that is very uh, self-serving and, it, and it's uh, ego rather than eco-awareness. <laughs> Wow, I mean that just that just changes that could change everything to have an awareness of these things. Right? I mean we don't know that. I think most of us don't know this. We don't understand the importance of our grief rituals, of our rites of initiation, of our understanding the, the medicine that we arrived here with. That's been really important for me, you know, to 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 realize that I've been, you know, in the world of surgery, which is about comparison. Am I as good as you? Right. Better than you. And I have to prove myself to you. And to, to, to give everyone the gift of recognizing that they are one of a kind and they have arrived in this incarnation with gifts that nobody else has seems to me would change the world would allow everybody to, to come into their fullest expression rather than trying to, you know, take these square pegs and put them in round holes. Right, right. I mean, I'm really feeling that as a, as a huge sense and source of grief and frustration and um, paralysis in my lifetime. Uh, you, you're, you're really talking about those two different paradigms of, of uh, looking at identity and belonging. Um, of uh, you know coming into our Western uh, society and modernity, um, you, you mentioned better and less than. Mm -hmm. So we come into this world, in this culture particularly, and we have our aptitude measured, and our interests evaluated, and based on those two uh, measures of aptitude and interest. Uh, we are given an occupational handbook to yeah. browse <laughs> oh. <laughs> and pick, go down the list. If yeah. you're fortunate, you'll fit one of those that you'll say, Oh, there's the name of my gift. And it's like, Oh, I'll do that. Um, and we're also given the mythology un, you know, subconsciously given the mythology of a culture or I don't know if I would say a culture, a society. Um, whose mythology is based in the values of that society. So as Joseph Campbell said, if you want to know the values of a society, you just look around and see what the tallest buildings are. And there you know your, there you know your mythology. And so certainly the, you know, the tallest buildings are economic and, and uh, commerce structures. And, um, and so we come in and, and we're handed this uh, mythology to fit into. Um, and it is a mythology where you can be better and you can be less and you're evaluated on that. The complete shift in paradigm, and I've seen this in, in various indigenous uh, understandings, is that uh, coming into this world it would be like you had looked around or you looked down here and you said, you know, I have this gift. I want to bring this gift there. And you would look to the realm of your ancestors from which you would come from and say, and I need your help and your help and your help uh, because you too carry this gift. And when I get down there, we need to stay in relationship and help me remember what I'm doing down there. That's kind of a, a really nutshell version of what that would look like. So we arrive here. Um, in some villages, there would even be maybe in like in Meldama's village, what they call a hearing where the, uh, the, the medicine person would sit with the, the pregnant uh, woman and listen for what is this one bringing here? Oh my goodness. And begin the communication of, okay, this is, this is what they're bringing. This is who they are. Um, it's like a name was not something that was uh, prescribed to you. A name is something we listen for. It's like, what is this one's name? Because we want their name to be uh, uh, a 
a measure of the frequency of the medicine they carry so that we have named them uh, so that the name they come in with speaks to where they're heading, not to a, a label. Um, and, uh, and then if we look at even, you know, looking at the, the word education, if we go back, at least in the Latin form, the, in my understanding is the Latin root word of the word education comes from educare, and it means to draw forth from within. So that in a, in a traditional form of teacher, a teacher was not to fill you up with information. They were to figure out what is this thing you carry that we can draw out of you? Because we need it, we need it. And if we looked at our youth by, uh, from the place of you came here carrying something we need, and we have to uh, help you stay connected with that so you can share it with us. And so, Initiatory passages, rites of passages were designed to activate the memory of those agreements you made with your ancestors before coming here about who you are coming here to be, what you are coming here to offer. And in that context, uh, you can't be better the same way you can't be less. You can be you or not be you. And that's, that's all you can be. <laughs> And it's better to be you, because if you don't be you, nobody else will. <laughs> and whatever gift you came here to deliver won't happen if you don't be you. And I think if you don't be you, you get sick. Yes, Something yes. Happens. Something breaks. I mean, I, I, am, I know this to be so, you know, and just to geek out for a minute with the neuroscience of it all, you know, if we are in this chronic state of survival, I know you know this, but I'm going to say it anyway, you know, and we're always worrying and looking for the predator and looking who's going to, you know, either best us or, or shut us down, then our whole physiology shifts so that we're not able to be self-nourishing. We're not able to heal. We're not able to have a viable and functioning immune system. So total right. healing really best occurs in a place of integration and balance. Mm -hmm. And that place is the place of trust. So right. if you're living all the time, like somebody's better than me, I don't belong, somebody's going to take my stuff. Right. That's not a place of trust. That physiologically does not support our healing. And it's, it's been my imagination that the place that is our sort of weak genetic link is the place where we break first. Right. It, it, we don't have the, the support to keep ourselves well. I mean, this understanding this, Cater, feels like, I mean, it would change everything. It would change the medical system. It would change the psychological work that we do and the need for those things. Because yeah. many of our illnesses are because we've forgotten or never known who we are. Right. It's, it's if you think about it this way, that the, the degree of turmoil in your life is proportional to the degree that you have become misaligned with your gift and the medicine you carry. And the more divergent those paths become, the more turmoil one feels. And, um, and yet lining back up, um, this, this, uh, that belonging is not about fitting in belonging is about authenticity um and 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 yeah the system that we have perpetuates anxiety and depression which then you know stimulates the the immune system in negative ways and and our cellular development in negative ways and and uh, you know, the, the diseases of our times, interestingly enough, are diseases where our own immune and cellular system seems to turn against itself. And it's like, isn't that an interesting message <laughs> that we have become our own virus? We've turned against ourselves. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a fascinating thing that this uh, finding that, that way in which you belong to the world. Uh, um, one of my favorite poets, David White, used that sentiment, how we belong, you know. Um, what's your way of belonging to the world? Um, and um, in the gift of medicine, the gift of healing that everyone brings in some form. Um, 
to have it be something that the world around us uh, requests. It's like, we need that from you. We need this. Thank you. Um, it, it, uh, so I say, when, when, when you find the crossroads of where your passion meets the needs of your people, there you will thrive, you will heal, and they will heal at that crossroads. And um, because giving the coming from the place of our passion and finding that place that meets the needs of our people is also the thing that helps us heal the most individually in, our, in ourselves and, and help and is our greatest gift to, uh, um, to others, human and non-human. I'm just talking about the, um, the human realm, but the, the human others and the non-human others. Um, you know, Joanna Macy, who I consider the, the grandmother of eco-activism and philosophy on the planet these days, um, said uh, in an interview, I was watching her one time, she said in an interview, said, I used to think that it was um, greed and ignorance that perpetuated a system that, that got us to where we are with all of our you know, social justice and medical and environmental and all these different systems of, of uh, response uh, uh, ability. Um, she said, I used to think it was greed and ignorance that perpetuated this and got us to where we are. She said, I don't think that anymore. She said, I think it is the unwillingness to feel grief. Wow. And, um, and I've really looked at that and I said, you know, if, if uh, I live in Asheville, North Carolina, I've seen a bumper, we're, we're famous for bumper stickers, <laughs> among other things, but uh, saw this one time, if you're not appalled, you're not paying attention. <laughs> and it's like this, this kind of layer of numbness that, that sits in our physical bodies and our physiology and our awareness. Um, and it's like to wake up is to feel. And, uh, and often the gateway to aliveness is our, our grief and other emotions that we have shut off from. You can't shut one emotion off without it shutting all of them. So if you, if you shut down the grief, you eventually have shut down your joy, your creativity. Um, all of these things get lost to, to just the state of numbness. And then we end up in this, this frantic kind of living in which we're searching for some kind of stimulation to feel alive. Um, and another one of my, uh, my uh, online or not, or back in the day where people wrote and read books mostly, um, oh. Joseph Campbell, he said, uh, I love this quote of his, he said, I don't think what we are searching for is a meaning for life. He said, I think what we're searching for is an experience of being alive. And I thought that explains it, you know? So the perpetuation of addictions and compulsions and, and all these things that, that are killing our physical bodies are an attempt to create a, a state of aliveness. Um, as momentary as, as it can be with addictions and other forms of compulsive addictive behavior, you know, it's, it's a sense of how do we feel alive? Um, and, uh, so yeah, waking up, waking up our, our, uh, emotional system, our cellular system, our physical system at, at these core levels of, of creativity and aliveness. And, um, it's exciting. It's we, thrilling. We've been exciting times. <laughs> well, and I'm sort of, I'm intrigued by the, um, apparently the root of the word medicine is actually restoration of right inward measure. Mm -hmm. like and meditation that. apparently is recognition of right inward measure. Mm -hmm. And so they're so intricately entwined and yet we don't, you know, I've been teaching mindfulness for a very long time. And the notion of paying attention to how you are, mm -hmm. how you feel or what's going on is very foreign to a lot of people. It certainly was to me. That's why I started to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to, I don't even know what that means. Like, what do you mean how do I feel? Because generally the response is fine. <laughs> you fine, know? Good or bad. Yeah. 
how do I feel? Like, what does it feel like? We just had a class last night where people are like, oh, that makes me happy. And I said, how does happy feel? And there's just this look like, I, what does that mean? Right. You know, like, where, where do you feel it in your body? And that feels, that for me has been the piece that was missing. You know, I've been, I've been a discombobulated head. You know, I've lived up here thinking and worrying and planning and making all kinds of arrangements. And I forgot that I was connected to my body. I lost connection to my heart. I totally lost connection with any ancestral lineage. All right. So, that we, you know, we've lost an emotional vocabulary. Yes. We have these limited... I feel good, bad, or fine. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that's kind of the or I don't know. That's the, that's the categories to choose from, and and none of them are really automatically connected to the physical body, um, and so uh, th this understanding that. Um, one of the things I teach and, and when I work with people, I talk about this, this thing I call the triangle of awareness is that when I'm talking with somebody and they're sharing a story with me and we're, we're moving into maybe doing some ritual work with them or something, I'm following this triangle. One is the story. One is the emotional aspects of this story. And then one is the physical body. Mm. First, I'm going to notice which part of the triangle are they talking to me from? Most of the time, it'll be the, the cognitive story piece. And then I'll deliberately start to move them somewhere else in the triangle. So as, you, you know, as you're telling me this story uh, of all these things, I'm really curious about the storyteller. And in the storyteller, I notice um, that your, your shoulders start to curve in as you say that. Yeah. You know? And I'm wondering if you just follow that uh, go back to that place in the story where you mentioned this thing happening, and now let's 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 watch what happens with your shoulders, um, and then what's the emotion connected with your shoulders moving in like that? Um, because it, it, it's it's certainly true that over time our our personal biography becomes our personal biology, um, as we're th this this. Uh, and there's much more to the triangle, but it's a very basic form that this connection between our cognitive stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves and how that connects to the emotional uh, charge and how that connects to our physical body and physiology, it's always connected. Mm -hmm. I mean, th there's not one part of that triangle that's not always connected to the other two. And, um, and to move people through the triangle, it's, it's like they drop down a layer of consciousness each time. If I move them from their story to their emotions, they're all of a sudden, yeah, and you have to come to the present moment, which you know, meditation is great for that. You can't move around the triangle without dropping into here and now. Um, and sometimes I've seen people uh, carry a story that's simply in their body. They have no cognitive or emotional context to it. And they come up, you know, I've got this, this pain and it just started happening. And then we'll start working just with the body and all of a sudden the emotions come online of what's connected and the story might evolve. Um, especially stuff that may be pre-verbal or pre-cognitive where you're not going to get the story, but you'll get the emotion and you'll get the physical part. Um, and to understand that memory is, is coded uh, and compartmentalized in very different ways. Um, and then there's ancestral uh, uh, turmoil and memory uh, that is coded in our in our genetics, uh, and in our energy system, and in our emotions, where we um, have lost connection to the original context or, or cognitive information, but yet the energetics, the physiology, um, and the emotional quality still transfer through the line um, it's it's uh fascinating because then we're now we're talking about back to where we started this kind of now we're working with the ancestral connections um and uh sure a funny story i heard with you about similar to this um which is i think it's, it was a story of a person who made was was cooking and they made this um 
don't know if it's a pot roast or something or meatloaf or something. When they were done, they cut off the ends and served it. And I tell you, maybe you and I talked about something. It was so funny. They did, and, and so somebody finally asked us, well, why are you cutting off the ends uh, to, the, to the meatloaf before you serve it? And it's like, I'm not sure what, that doesn't make sense. And they didn't know why, really. And uh, so they asked their mother, who asked their grandmother, um, and they got back to the story that was several generations old, and it had to do with somewhere back there, a grandmother had a certain size cooking pan. And every time it would cook, it would kind of overflow the, on the edges, and they would just cut the edges off so it would fit the pan. Yes. Um, and so generations later, they're cutting the They don't know why, but they're, <laughs> they're cutting the ends off because that's what mom did. That's what grandmother did. That's what great-grandmother did. And it's, it's a presentation now. Um, and so we have these habits. Um, if, uh, I, so this would be for the listening audience. So if I said, you know, take your hands and clasp your fingers together and rest them in your lap a moment, take a breath and look down and notice which thumb that you have crossed over the other thumb. Could be your right, could be your left, but one of them will be crossed over the other. <clears throat> and then I will, uh, uh, my, my hypothesis would be that every time you cross your hands and put them in your lap, that thumb goes over the other thumb. You don't ever do it the other way. Matter of fact, if you try to switch them and do that, listening audience, you could switch them up. All of a sudden you feel, maybe you feel a little anxious, nervous, awkward. It's like something's off. Um, but what you've also done is you've heightened your awareness in the present moment because you've changed a habit. Um, and anytime you, you change a habit, you pull your attention to the moment and you increase your awareness. And we would interpret that change initially as, oh, I feel kind of weird or awkward. But I say, oh, stay with that. And notice, tell me if you're not more aware now than you were aware a few moments ago. It's like, oh. I'm way aware now, you know, before I didn't even notice I had thumbs. <laughs> um, so consider that and then think about, we have habits of behavior, habits of thought, habits of emotion that we are just uh, automatic with. And we don't even consider that these habitual forms of thinking, feeling, doing tend to deaden our awareness. Um, and when we deaden our awareness, we just, we're just kind of moving through life out of these habitual ancestral ways of being um, that then turn into, you know, can turn into disease and, uh, and, and physical turmoil. Um, my great, my, my favorite, uh, I'm going to talk about habits of, of thought. Um, my favorite one is to say that the greatest mass delusion on the planet um, we call sunrise or sunset. <laughs> and that every time we say that, we envision the sun moving. We don't actually envision the earth rolling. <laughs> and so we've got this, this uh, delusion of, of the, that's what created e eco uh, or ego, is that we thought we were the center of the universe. Sunrise, sunset, creates all kinds of problems. <laughs> Um, but it's just these little simple things are around. It's like, wow, I've never considered how many habitual ways of thinking, feeling, doing run my life. And, um, and therefore lead to eventual patterns of posture that then turn into other physical issues or, or, um, and anytime you break a habit, you, you bring in and gather in more energy more aliveness and and it's an experiment you can do anytime you can you can start off each day and if you wear pants put on put on your pants legs you know put the other leg in first that you usually don't do or brush your teeth with the other hand and, and if you do these simple things then during the day just change something up all of a sudden your awareness starts to expand you know drive the work a different way and it will break you out of this 
this habitual way of being that, that creates an aliveness. Um, Cause I think those habitual patterns are what lead the physical body to becoming eventually um, troubled, you know, in energetic medicine, um, disease is uh, in turmoil is tracked before it becomes physical. It can be tracked in the energetic field um, before it actually enters the body. And so intervention can, can, um, can be directed to the, to the, to the field, to the energetic field um, preemptively before it actually enters the physical body. And it can also be diagnostically noticed. Um, but the, all these things require a little bit more expansion of our sense of what's possible. Well, and that just speaks also to the, the if I may, fallacy of Western medicine that early detection in the body is early detection. Because in, I think in the energetic world and in most ancient wisdom traditions, that disease has been here a long time before it finally ends in the physical body. Yes, yes. It's really starting to bring some level of awareness so that we're seeing or feeling or noticing mm -hmm. something's a little bit off dealing with that before it actually shows up as a physical dis-ease. Right. Or a mental or emotional or spiritual dis-ease. Like really, instead of turning away from that, like embracing right. the information that it's offering us. Yeah, it's... it's uh... You know, a quote from John Muir said, you know, we can't pick out anything in nature without realizing it's connected to everything else. And um, my inquiry in mind always wants to go, well, if, if something's here, where did it come from <laughs> before it got here? <laughs> and how can we address it, you know, over there before it ends up here? Yes. Um, and so it's, uh, you yeah, know, that sense that we're really connected. We're connected to our environment, we're connected to each other, we're connected to our ancestors and our descendants. Um, and that diseases and, and, emo and, and turmoils of the physical body didn't begin there. Um, they began somewhere else. Um, and that takes us back to where we started um, with that quote in the beginning that the, the troubles of this world can only be healed from the other world and the troubles in the other world can be healed from this world. And so this reciprocal responsibility of attention and relationship and healing um, to bring that back in, it's like um, if there's something out of balance here, if there's turmoil here, then what we can just assume is that we already know there's turmoil there. And if our response to healing doesn't include uh, that, you know, addressing uh, the other than living human realm, um, then it's going to be limited. Yes. And, it, and it's, uh, uh, you know, disease will have a, find, a way of finding another outlet of expression uh, to, to knock on our door to wake us up. Um, and so it's, uh, and it's not just the human people, it's the non-human people that we need to be aware of. It's like, it's all connected. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing is that our belonging, uh, you know, it's interesting. One of the, the, the things people struggle with emotionally the most is a sense of disconnection, isolation, depression, you know, a lack of any sense of belonging. And, and yet in a universe where we're connected to everything, um, and belong there. It's like how do we how do we uh, activate that memory, that knowing, um, you know, and, and that coming back into connection with nature um, to restore that sense of belonging uh, and healing. Um, I asked Maladoma. He and I had a conversation about death one time, <laughs> and. Uh, he, he's he he said death not not nat not natural. And so so what do you mean not natural? He said well, what would be natural is that you decide you're done and you leave. <laughs> and he'd witness that. Yeah. 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 Was, I feel complete. I have uh, offered what I came here to offer, 
I'm tired, I'm ready to go home and I'm leaving now. And they just shut, they kind of like shutting down your systems. Go. Um, I think that happens. I think, it, you know, we look for another name for it. Um, but if you're, if you are, if you've been around any hospice worker or any, any hospice work, you can see people often will choose their exit points. Um, and he said, death by other means would require a divination to see what happened and what needs to be attended to in relation to that which uh, uh, they didn't they didn't deliver. You know, he would say that we're we're not only born with a particular gift of medicine to bring, we're also born with the proportional degree of power to deliver it. Mm -hmm. And we often use up that power in all these other uh, dramas and turmoils unrelated to the gift. And so the gift is left sitting there. Um, and we end up leaving the, with, leaving the world without the gift ever having been uh, delivered. Um, and then the gift gets angry at us, um, you know, and that, that, that in itself is a, can be a state of, of, of turmoil and challenge, you know, this, um, this idea that that which we brought is not getting acknowledged, that we're not even acknowledging it. Um, and bringing us one more time back to rites of passage, you know, we come to these thresholds in our lives. Um, where the life of belonging that calls us forward uh, is not concerned with the comforts of the old life. <laughs> and uh, so the transition to that new one requires some, some letting go of the old ways of, uh, that we've grown comfortable with. It's like having a a beautiful pair of shoes you really liked and now they're so old and they don't fit and your feet have grown and now they're uncomfortable. And it's like, oh, I can't wear these anymore. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm, 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 I'm called into a life of belonging um, that may not fit the mythology that I've been living because we're always called into our personal mythology. And, it, and if we're not initiated in some way into the, uh, into the mythology, into the bone memory of your own life, um, then you'll likely be living an existence that's not entirely your own. And that turmoil will then begin to show up physically. Um, so that's, it's always best to, you know, to be, to be who you came here to be. <laughs> Yes, and while it would be wonderful to have that kind of support the minute you get here, um, I, I think and hope that the, the good news is, is that once you understand that you are here for a reason, then you amass your support to help you find your gift, to help you express your gift in the way that you need. And for me, um, a huge part of that has been doing a divination ceremony with you. So I wonder if you would just share in the last few moments, what this is, this calorie shell divination, what, like, how does it work? Because it completely transformed me. Um, I've been on this path for a long time, but the information that I received from that reading has, has really, really rocked my world in a good way um, and, and given me direction and insight that I would have never otherwise had. Um, how does it work? Yeah, that's the, that's the mystery. <laughs> yes, tell us the mystery. No, just, you know, the gist, like what do you do and how do you know and where does your wisdom come from? So, gosh, so many things. Every, so every culture has forms of divining, listening, um, connecting in with some source greater than oneself for guidance. Um, as, as Mel Doma what said to me, he said, he said, I'm not interested in teaching you about what I know. And, and I would, and I, when I repeat this to my students, I say, because what I know could, we, we might could fill a quarter of a thimble. <laughs> uh, maybe. I said, what I would be interested in teaching you is teaching you about the things that teach me. 
and let you be in relationship with those things, those beings. And so um, divination is a, a system of uh, deeply listening um, to the guidance from, um, we could just generally say helping spirits, whether you call that uh, the angels or Jesus or your ancestors or whatever alignment you have to those powers and forces greater than your own knowing. Um, so it's your relationship to the sacred in whatever form that uh, you connect with it in and listening to information that comes in um, and then conveying that information. Um, so in my, uh, you know, as a, as a psychotherapist for 30 plus years, um, I learned over many, many, many thousands of hours of sitting with people and mirroring and listening and speaking, um, that sometimes there was, uh, information that I would comment on that wasn't obviously present in the room, wasn't part of the story, just something would come in, I would think, hmm, that's odd. And at first, in my early, you know, I started off when I was 25, I used to think, well, it's just a kind of a random thought. It's just, matter of fact, it's, it's distracting. <laughs> it's like, let me get with this person here. And then I would begin to pay attention to how the information came in and what it was like. And then I began to check it out with people. And I would say, you know, so I had this strange thought or had this idea about this, that, or the other. And then all of a sudden they would light up and say, ah, that's about this or that and this. And I would think, huh, where's that coming from? Um, so the, in learning uh, cowrie shell divination from Maladoma, it, it became a system of um, reading information that would be present in the shells and in, in the other items, that one is simply reading the information, like I can physically, this, this is placed here, and so this is generally about this. Um, and then there's reading other information that comes in out of nowhere, well, not nowhere, but out of the mystery, we'll say, and learning to pay attention to that, community, and trust it. Just like I was doing divination with somebody yesterday, and before we even started, I said, do you wake up between 3 and 4 a.m.? And they said, how did you know that? <laughs> And all I could say is, well, they just told me to ask you. <laughs> I don't know. They said, ask her this. And, and then we got into this conversation about what's going on and what might be needed to happen. Um, so this, it, it's been a, you know, a lifetime of gradually learning how to listen um, and trust. Um, and sometimes I th say things that I have no rational basis for even understanding why I would be saying it. Um, and really watch to see if it resonates with the other person. Um, and I will say over the years, it has definitely deepened my sense of gratitude and humility to um, the loving support that is present with us um, and being able to access that support and that wisdom. Um, and... Uh, so whatever the system of divination is, I think uh, for those that, that offer that and offer that well, it's not something they offer, that's something they, they, they put, as it was told to me, to me, a diviner puts themselves on loan to the spirit to, to say something, to offer something. Um, and so it's, it's something definitely that is through relationship, uh, with uh, sources of love and wisdom um, rather than something that is uh, coming from me or from a diviner. Um, so the system of divination may be specific to a way that one learns, but the communication and what one's relating has less to do with whether you're doing cowrie shell divination or some other form of divination and more to do with your relationship um, to those other realms and being able to listen and convey that. Um, 
that's that's how I've experienced, and um, it it uh, continues to amaze me as much as it does other people. Um, when you know they they convey things that it's like how you know how is it that these just configuration of shells and bones and items and you get this it's a you know one either i'm pointing to, well it just says that that's what i see here or it's like i don't know it's uh it, it's just what what came out um and so partly for i think a lot of uh, a lot of in, uh, diviners hide out as therapists or, or mental health workers because it's a it's a good storefront. <laughs> you can you can use uh, in in psychology we would call it empathic resonance, <laughs> where you empathically have resonance with the person and you can just convey stuff that is not evident in their story. <laughs> um, so it's uh yeah my psychotherapy practice pretty much evolved into doing divinations and then all this other stuff uh, that i offer so it's um yeah continually humbled and grateful to uh to be the ambassador at times for such uh such guidance um but i'm just a regular old guy well i i disagree with that completely <laughs> Um, and I, you know, I've often said in my life that the thing that I longed for the most <clears throat> was somebody who could really like hold sacred space so that I could feel safe enough to be me, which is not a, not a common thing. Yeah. Um, and that of all the things, of all of the information that I received from you, the most important thing that I felt was your capacity to hold this sacred space and to just, to just listen in a way that, that I have just longed for you know, to be heard, whether it's verbal or, or, you know, intuitive or whatever. It's just, you just hold a beautiful space. Mm -hmm. And I, I cannot thank you enough for your gifts and your humility and your wisdom and, um, and truly just your presence and capacity to, to be so deeply present to others. Mm, thank you so, for that. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's, and uh, so we're running short of time, Cater. <laughs> uh, I can't, I hate always for that to be the case because I could talk to you forever. But the good news is that I believe if people sign up for your website, sign up on your email list, you're going to draw uh, a number of people for a free 30 minute divination. Right. So if you, um, within, I guess, the week, mm -hmm. but I usually take the week before the week after your, um, when you air this this uh, interview, is I pull the names of people that uh, sign up for the newsletter uh, on the website, and then from those names I'll um, randomly draw three names and offer um, a free thirty minute divination awesome. online like this. Or if you're if it happens to if I happen to draw somebody that's close, you know they're welcome to come over. Um, but otherwise we would do it in this format. Um, so yeah. Well, I can highly recommend it. I know everybody's going to want to get in the pot to have their name drawn. So yeah, and, and um, yeah, the website simply is my name, um, spelled K-E-D-A-R, brown.com. Um, and if you went to that website, you could uh, sign up for the newsletter and also read about divinations in more detail. And all of that information is going to be posted um, just below this video. Okay. Cool. Everybody will have access to that. Okay. So, Cater, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us? Any final gem among all of the gems that you've already shared before we go? I'll share, uh, a, I'll offer you a question, and this was given to me um, in a similar way at the end of something when I asked the question like that. <clears throat> And so what I would leave with, with our listening audience is <clears throat> in light of all that you've heard today uh, in, in our conversation, um, don't ask what does all this mean? Um, because meaning is very fluid and it can change. It's, it's, I always say it's like holding water in your hand. It's gonna move. You're not gonna be able to hold it in one place. <clears throat> but ask, in light of all that I've heard today, what actions am I guided to take? 
And I always say, uh, my disclaimer is that as long as they're loving actions within the bounds of your own integrity, do it. And not actions like, what am I going to do with my life? You know, maybe um, what actions am I going to take when I get home tonight from work with my children, um, with my colleagues? What, how can I be, what action can I take with myself that would be more loving today? Um, so really narrow it down to something in, in time and space that's, uh, again, less than the big question of what am I going to do with my life and say, what actions can I take this week? Uh, or what actions am I inspired to take so that your experience um, moves into action uh, more quickly? And as uh, one of my teachers, uh, Will Rockingbear, used to tell me, he said, you know, love is an action. And that's all he would say, but love is an action. Mm -hmm. So what is the action? Um, so that would be the question I would leave everyone with today. That's beautiful. Thank you so, so much, Kate. You're welcome, Gina. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, I look forward to seeing you again down the road. Yes, <laughs> it's been awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. And thanks to everybody for watching. Go well. <laughs>